you. Thank you. How wonderful to be here. I'm, I'm just delighted to be here. I want to thank Sheila for all the emails and arrangements and everything and for making everything so easy. I'm, I'm um, happy to be here to, to share some things with you all. Um, I'm not going to talk about the economic crisis. I'm not going to talk about tough economic times. I could care less. Let's talk about other things for just a little while, if that's okay. I just, you know, we've all had enough of that, I think. Uh, we can go back to reality tomorrow afternoon. Um, well, you, we, you can go back to reality. I'll go back to teaching for a living. He's working for a living, so I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, be heading back home. Our quarter hasn't started yet, so it's all still bright and sunny and shiny, and then the students turn up on Tuesday, and they'll all be downhill from there. Um, uh, before I get too far started, though, um, we have always known, those of us who educate people for our profession, uh, have always known that our best eyes and ears for the next generation of the profession is you all. And there's a few huskies in the crowd. Um, those students you work with, the people who work in your library, the, the, who have yet to receive the degree, et cetera, um, who you think are going to be the next great generation to take our places and do terrific work in the profession, send them our way. Uh, it's highschool.washington.edu. Um, there are lots of other really good schools. We're just slightly better. Um, <laughs> um, uh, we've had a, a great strong tradition of lots of terrific Montana folks over the last several years, especially in the online program, but also um, residentially. Uh, application deadline, February 1st. Um, uh, I'm particularly happy to be here because it helps me fill in a little thing on the map. Um, this is my 44th state. It's my first visit to Montana. Uh, which I find really hard to imagine. Yeah. Um, and it's my 44th state, so you can, I'm doing fairly well. Uh, I'll never get to Delaware. How I miss Delaware. You can't quite see Delaware in the center. How I miss Delaware all those years living back east, I'll never know. The ones in the bottom, uh, but I was like, well, what, of course I'm being on tape. Hi, <laughs> Arkansas, listening to this. I'd love to come to Arkansas someday, or Mississippi for that. Um, I think it's hard to imagine I'm going to get to Arkansas, Mississippi. Oh, I got, I, oh, I, I got Georgia. I don't like Georgia. All right, so it's 45. Ooh, it's 45. Um, so I got picked up a state without even knowing it. It's got a little brain fart. Oh, well. Um, I am delighted to be here. Um, and I am delighted to bring you greetings from the beautiful Pacific Northwest. Um, those of you who've been to Seattle know that it looks like that every day. <laughs> It's looked like that every day this summer. We've had one of those summers that just won't quit. Um, so yeah, we all live on Queen Anne. We all live in the mountain every day. We all go around the Space Needle every other day. You know, even there, um, it's amazing the things people think. Um, uh, and if you've been to Seattle, you might have been here. Has anybody actually been to this? It's quite a place, isn't it? This is the main central library of Seattle Public Library, downtown Seattle. Um, on the side of the original two buildings, so there was a Carnegie Library and there was a sort of mid-50s monstrosity. And now we have this, which, say what you will about it, and people have said all kinds of things about it, um, is quite a striking building. Um, and uh, it's on the tourist map, which is kind of other. And you see it like in the background of commercials and so on, even national commercials. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, so I want to start with a few pictures of libraries, just to get us to thinking about the way we think about libraries and how they're used and what they're for. The main story I want to tell about this building is that it got built. Seattle is one of those cities where everybody has to agree on everything, and so consequently nothing ever gets done. You know, we're all we're all sitting around drinking lattes in the rain, you know, oh I don't know, what do you think about this? Blah 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 blah. And as a consequence, I mean we can't get a decent mass transit system, we can't get the roads fixed, we can't, nothing gets done. Except this building. So the people of the city passed a bond issue 15 years ago now, um, which renovated every branch in the system, built new ones, expanded most of them, and built this thing. Um, now, it takes a lot of force of will to get a building like that built anywhere, let alone in a city where everybody has to agree with it. So this is the monument to Deborah Jacobs, who was the city librarian for many years, got this building built and uh, used to teach for us when she was a city librarian, um, taught the public libraries and advocacy class, and used to bring the mayor, the 
mayor of Seattle and his two thuggish bodyguards. <laughs> you could always tell when Deborah was teaching the, you know, the you know, meet the mayor class because you have these, you know, behemoths in the hallway, you know, little earpieces being inconspicuous. Yeah, in a library school. They blended really well. Um, so this building got built because the people of the city of Seattle thought it was important to spend the money on a bond issue to build libraries. Um, this is my branch of Seattle Public. This is the Northeast branch, about four or five blocks from my house. And it's a little washed out with the light, but you can see it. It looks like an urban public library branch. Um, there's people on the computers, that's the DVDs and audiobooks in the backgrounds, the kids' room, and the you know, kids roll around the carpet over there, and there's a meeting room, and the stacks, and a reference desk. And, you know, it looks like a public library. Actually, this branch um, was is the largest in the system. Not much bigger than this room, but it's the largest in the system. Um, and is now being renovated again. Uh, this opened four years ago, five years ago. It's being renovated again because the hold space wasn't big enough. Um, so they're expanding the hold space, they're moving the children's collection around. Um, so already it's not, it's being fixed, which is fascinating. When you, when you see a, a public library branch like this, it sort of looks like a living room. It's very comfortable, it's very warm and inviting, except for the holes, which are now everywhere in the building and they're moving that around. Um, it, this gives us a vision of libraries that are sort of every day, a part of your life, a part of the community. Part of the reason that the branches in Seattle are so small is because there's so many of them. Seattle is one of those cities where they decided to have lots of little branches all over the place. Um, and so there's something like, I should know this because I live there and I'm a librarian. Um, 30, 40 branches in the city proper and the rest of the county has a different system and there's more there. Um, so you're never more than, you know, a 10 or 15 minute drive from any, anywhere in the city from a public library branch. And so that tells us something about the way we think about libraries, the way we feel about libraries, and in particular the way normal people feel about libraries. Not us, because we're not normal anymore, but the way they do. So, this is one, this is one of my libraries. This is the other. Um, this is the main, yeah, well, you know, uh, it's the life I need. Uh, so this is the main reading room of the Susilo Library, which is the main university library at the University of Washington. Uh, and it's one of these big old, you know, mid-twenties neo-Gothic piles, you know, the way they did. Um, this was built at a time when the president of the university referred to the University of Washington, which was still undergoing fairly radical growth in those days, referred to it as the University of a Thousand Years. And if you're going to build the University of a Thousand Years, that's the library that you put smack in the middle of it. So, and it is physically in the, in the dead center of campus, right on Red Square. Um, and, and, and right off the vista where you can see Mount Rainier. Um, and this tells us something about the way we think about libraries, too. If this is your living room, and you're very comfortable, and you go get, you, know, you get your sort of everyday needs met here, this speaks of libraries as something that is enduring, and noble, and um, important. This is important too, but in different ways. So, sort of simultaneously, this is how people think about libraries. And it's sort of the way we think about them too, the everyday and the eternal, the ordinary and the noble. Um, and so this tells us a lot about how we think and feel about libraries. And I want that to just sort of tickle away in the back of your head. Um, as I switch gears a little bit and talk about reference. So I was born to be a reference librarian. My mother was a reference librarian. You know, it's a genetic thing. Um, she gave me the World Almanac every year for Christmas, and I used to read it in the week between Christmas and New Year. You know, they moved the index from the front to the back, I didn't even know it, for like five years. Because who uses the index? Because you know where it is. Um, Samuel Green, a lot of you have probably read this article. This is the first article we know of that talks about reference, even though it doesn't use the word. Um, personal relations with readers. We don't call them readers anymore, but we don't call them personal relations anymore. Either, so that's probably just as well. Uh, readers in popular libraries, what we would call public library today, uh, need a great deal of assistance. This is 1876. This is particularly needed by persons unused to handling books or conducting investigations. There isn't a whole lot new there. Uh, Green in 1876 says, we, do we help people because there's too much stuff and it's hard to find. 
Now this is 1876 in the Worcester Free Library in Massachusetts, which I don't know, but I'm guessing fits in this room too. And there are people. Now this is also the time when there are the cataloging wars are going on. So there's like a couple dozen competing cataloging codes. You walk into different libraries with no idea what the cataloging structure was. Um, this is when public libraries are being built. Uh, this is when there's the big debate about open stacks versus closed stacks. Not as a preservation argument, but as a service argument. So there was a strong service argument for closed stacks in public libraries. That people would get better service if there were closed stacks. Because... Well, things stay in order. But, so that makes it easier for us. But better service with closed stacks in a public library because... They would have to ask for assistance and you were more qualified than they were trying to want. They might pick the wrong yeah. thing. <laughs> so we'll just stop that because we'll tell them what the right thing is. Thank goodness we don't do that anymore. <laughs> Those days are over. Um, Green talks about searching Mr. Poole's wonderful new index, you know, Poole's Index Periodic Literature, evaluating resources, instruction, consumer information, okay, it's about lightning rods, but still, it's consumer information. Um, <laughs> alert services, which is you go find something and give it to the mayor so that he will love you and then give you more money. Um, reader's advisory, there's a great, readers, if there's time at the end, I'll tell the reader's advisory story, it's so funny. Um, medical, medical disclaimers, etc. Be nice, don't make them dependent on you, don't take a point of view on politics. There's not a lot that's new here. Um, and this is 130 plus years ago. Um, my favorite uh, work about reference is still Margaret Hutchins. She wrote the textbook about reference in the middle part of the 20th century. This is 1944. Um, reference work in includes the direct personal aid. Love that phrase. Direct personal aid within a library. So remember library. You know what a library is. Within a library, to persons in search of information for whatever purpose, blah, 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 blah. Most of the rest of that definition <coughs> is necessary. Direct personal aid within a library. That's a powerful concept. It's a powerful phrase. And, and we'll come back to that, too. And then this is, this is at the end of her book. Um, this is the textbook, but this is the end of her book. Reference has become an indispensable public service because it's saved, she's making three points here. It saves the money of the individual. Okay, we make the money-saving argument all the time. You know, we subscribe to ProQuest and NEBSCO and OED and you know whatever Britannica, uh, so that everybody else, so that everybody can use it. And you don't have to have individual subscriptions to journals. You don't have to have you know departmental collections, whatever. Fine. So the money argument, I think we, we make. Probably don't make it as convincingly as we could. I don't think people really get how much money we're actually saving. But, Save the money in the image. Okay, we're cool with that. By furnishing skilled bibliographical aid, that would be reference work, in the use of reference materials, it saves the time of busy people. I don't think we make the time argument as, as often or as well or as compelling. Um, in an age of Google and Wikipedia and you know, all of that, um, the time saving argument may seem counterintuitive. It may seem like Google's got to be faster. And for many things, Google is faster. But there are also things where we are faster because we are able to do things that normal people can't do or think of. And I'll come back to that as we go. But I think the time argument, the time-saving argument, in a world where the, the information is no longer in scarce supply, in Green's day, and Hutchins' day for that matter, um, information is the commodity in, in scarce supply. Now it's not. Now the scarce supply is time and attention. So making the argument that we can save people's time, and by extension they can do a better job with the time they have, I think is, is, a very, is still a compelling argument and one that we've kind of lost track of. And ensures, her third argument ensures possession of facts which by themselves they could not obtain. You know, substitute information for facts or resources or materials, whatever you want to say. Um, we let them do things that they couldn't otherwise do um, by themselves. And, and that's 
I think that's the key to a lot of it. So I'll come back to that as well. So a little washed out too. That I hope that looks like a reference dance. It is a reference dance. Here's the end. Okay. Um, and it's a beautiful, a beautiful. I mean, it's not dissimilar to these chandeliers actually. The beautiful wrought iron chandelier and the nice carved wood reference desk and the beautiful wood columns and the books in the background. And there isn't a laptop sitting on there, but if there was, you could probably work there tomorrow, right? And it'd be kind of cool, which is lovely. Um, and this is a hundred year old picture. This is the Northampton Public Library in Massachusetts in 1905. Now, I'm all for charm and history and la 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 and whatever. And, but if we were uh, nurses and doctors, and if that was an operating theater from 1905, <laughs> your first instinct would not be, hey, I'd be keen to work there. So, <laughs> you know what we do. Uh, we examine the information needs of our communities and the individuals with it, survey and understand the information environment, figure out what to do with it, or else. Um, I said I wouldn't talk about tough times, or else. I don't know how many of you read Inside Higher Ed on a regular basis. Did you see it this morning? This clown from somewhere in California, San Jose, San Diego. It's always some clown in California. Like the vice president for, vice provost for administration. You know what they're like. Kill me. Um, who says that, you know, most academic library services will be outsourced in the next 10 years. Cataloging can be outsourced to other libraries. Why didn't we think of that? Why didn't we think of other libraries doing each other's catalog? Holy crap! That's my keys. Holy crap! What a great idea! Or better yet, we could outsource cataloging to Google. Oh, hey, that's going to save a lot of time. Okay. So this kind of nonsense is going on, especially in this kind of climate. So that's my only, you know, do 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 about tough things all the time. But, so this clown is running around and some, now mind you, James Neal from Columbia is like, you know, you're kind of full of crap, which is reassuring, um, <laughs> because he kind of is. But he also, you know, it's kind of right, is that, you know, if you're a vice provost for planning and budgeting, your job is to, like, kill people. So, <laughs> you, know, you know, I mean, your job is to get the budget down and, look, there's a tasty thing right across the square. Look at that big building. Is there anybody even in there anymore? Does anybody go to the library? I just Google all the time. Okay, first of all, he probably does. So that's an education <laughs> effort on our part. If, if Vice Provost for Administration see us as a big old box of books that nobody goes to anymore, we're already in it. So go home to your Vice Provost of Budgeting and Administration, whoever that person is, <laughs> buy them a muffin basket, take them on a tour of the library, pet them, you know. <laughs> Are, do a little alert service, you know, maybe slip something into their, into their drink or whatever, you know, hypnotize them, whatever you have to do. Um, you know, get pictures of them and some sort of compromising situation. <laughs> I don't think we're above that sort of thing these days. Um, and make sure that they know what you do, because it doesn't matter if this, I mean, it matters if the students and the faculty and everybody else knows what you do, but if the people with the money don't know what you do. So that was a little unwelcome thing. The information environment that we live in continues to evolve. It always has. Um, and so I just want to spend a minute on each of these. Um, what am I going to tell you about technology that you don't already know? Um, it just keeps. It just keeps. Um, the, the thing is that when, when people think about what's happening to libraries like this clown in California, this poor man, I don't even know his name, I mean, if I, which never stopped me before. Um, <laughs> You know, they think about the way things are changing in the library world, and it immediately becomes a technological thing. You know, it's about the internet, it's about Google, it's about Twitter, it's about Second Life, it's about Facebook, it's about, it's about, it's about. Well, it kind of is, but it's also kind of about um, the incredibly volatile information marketplace we find ourselves in. Um, you know, when Disney bought Marvel, you know, that's a big thud right there. There's you know, this kind of consolidation when Elsevier and between Elsevier and, you know, a handful of others, Emerald, <laughs> sorry, uh, <laughs> let's publish the same article over and over again and see if anybody figures it out. So, 
Um, I'm in one of those kinds of moods today for some reason. So just strap yourselves in. Um, uh, you've got more and more of what we always thought of as traditional stuff in fewer and fewer hands. You think about what Disney owns, you think about what Elsevier owns, you think about what Bertelsmann owns, you think about what the News Corporation owns, you think about what Clear Channel owns, you know, you've got a handful of these monstrous, maybe a double handful, of these monstrous corporations, Gail Thompson, uh, uh, and everything that they own. And so you've got fewer and fewer people to deal with, which is nice, except that you have fewer and fewer choices. And you know the big deal is a symptom of that, and these horrible license agreements are a symptom of that, and, and pricing structures for journals that are completely out of whack with reality, or you know journals that cost thirty, forty thousand dollars a year a piece. Oh, um, all of that's a symptom. Of that. At exactly the same time, that consolidation has happened at exactly the same time. But there's this incredible explosion of free stuff, the blogosphere and social networking, and podcasts, and Twitter, and the free web, and all of that. So you've got all of this stuff that's now free, and kind of out there, and kind of everywhere, and kind of, you know, you tell me. And, and more and more of the traditional stuff um, in fewer and fewer hands. That's a, I don't think any previous generation of librarians has ever faced anything like that. Back to Ashurbani Paul. You know, I think that's new to us. And what does that mean? How does that, among other things, it means that people have got to be paying attention. Because it, it's harder to get the good stuff, it's easier to get the crap or the free stuff. And then you've got to figure out what the good stuff is among the free stuff. And you is everybody. I would think we have a role to play in helping with that, but, but I digress. Um, so that information marketplace just continues to get you know, volatile. Um, there are profound social and demographic changes at work in our society. Uh, by the middle of the century, there's by the middle of this century, there's no majority ethnic or racial group um, in the United States. Non-Hispanic whites will be 47 percent of the U.S. population by 2050. Um, within 20 years or so, um, the median, the, the the number of people 65 or older will be something like 60 million. That's going to be even worse. We'll age out into the over 65 category. Uh, that, that kind of society is going to have different kinds of information needs and approach information differently. And that's going to affect the way we do our business. Um, all the political stuff, um, intellectual property, copyright, privacy, intellectual freedom, um, on and on and on. I think we think differently now than we used to. As I was driving to the airport yesterday, how frightening is this? As I was driving to the airport yesterday, I was listening to NPR and there was this big story about texting while driving. <laughs> Which, first of all, I don't have a cell phone. Never had a cell phone. So I'm not one of these people. But the study that they cited said that almost half of people under 30 said they text while they drive. Now, this is on I-5 so I'm heading the airport. <laughs> this was not what I wanted to hear. Um, and they talked to this young woman who had this horrible accident. She was texting, she's like 19, she had this horrible accident, ran through a stop sign, broke her ankle, broke her shoulder, blah, 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 was in a wheelchair for six months, yada, yada, yada. And then a year later she was texting. She said, I tried really hard, I was only texting like at stoplights and only like five minutes, but I just couldn't stop. It was like she was a heroin addict. And she's, you know, and they talk to these teenagers who are like, I'm not gonna, I like texting while I'm driving, it's fine. I'm like, get off my freaking road. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Utah just passed this law where if you kill somebody texting while driving, it's 15 years. So if that works, Utah. Utah. Good for them. Um, so we think differently. I mean, people can't actually text while they drive. They must do, because they're not picking up bodies off the street every other day. But we think differently. Um, oh, this is always a fun question. So I'm not going to answer Because <laughs> it's a horrible question. I want to go around this through the side door. I want to talk about what it means to be in the library. Because I think that, remember Margaret Hutchins, direct personal aid within a library. So what does it mean to be in the library? I think that's a much more interesting question. And I think it has an answer. So physically, this is an easy question to you are in the library when you're in the library. This is why I make the big bucks. Uh, 
when you cross the threshold. So when somebody crosses the threshold, when they walk in the building, they're in the library. And we recognize that. So people, I'm imagining in most of your institutions, people without bar borrowing privileges, if I were to walk into one of your libraries tomorrow, I would get to do lots of things. I could use the catalog, I could use the databases, I could use the Xerox machine, I could you know, browse the stacks, I could read, I could do a lot of things. I can borrow, maybe I can print, maybe I can't, maybe I can download, maybe I can't. Um, but I can do lots of things because I'm in the library. So we all recognize that that's a thing. Um, and when people are you know, they're, they're in the library, they're in the library, that's an easy thing to figure out. But, are you in the library when you visit a book? Kind of. Kind of. I mean, it's, a, it's an extension of the library. And it, it, that's pretty much the same thing about a branch. Um, either a departmental branch on a college campus or a, a public library branch. Um, you know, part of the reason that Seattle built lots of little branches all over the place, um, and part of the reason why uh, the UW has like 16 branch libraries all over campus is because you want, you want libraries and their services and things to be as close to people as they possibly can. Now, you get advantages by conglomeration, but you also get advantages by dispersion. So this idea of dispersing the library of having the library be in lots of different manifestations and lots of different places is a very old idea. So virtual, in, in the in digital space, this gets a little sticky. And this a lot of this manifests in licensing agreements. But if you follow the same kind of reasoning, people are in the library when they cross the digital threshold. So when they hit the website, when they do a search on a catalog or a database, when they ask you a reference question on chat or email or a web form or something, when they download an audio book or an e-book, when they are somehow in contact with you or the resources or the space in some way virtually, I think that's sort of crossing the virtual threshold. I think they are in the library when they are on your website, when they are searching your databases, when they engaging you for a reference interaction, when they are doing something like that, they are in the library. Um, and and for, I think for many people that's not a foreign concept. There are a lot of people who use libraries much more virtually than they do physically. I certainly do. Um, I certainly am in Seattle Public way more frequently online than I am in person because it's easier for me. And I'd say much the same for the university library is that I'm far more frequently you know, engaged on the website than I walk in the building. I do go in the building quite a bit, but buildings are quite a bit. But, mm. So this notion of being in the library in a virtual sense um, is important. So this is my sort of distillation of being in the library. People are in the library anywhere, anytime, any way, that they are interacting with information that is organized, provides, provided, supported by their own community via the staff. And there's lots of important pieces in there and they're pulled as a part of the center. Um, that's what it means to be in the library, to me. So what does that mean the library is? So let's go back around to the original question, what's a library? To me, that's these things. And I, I got my first introduction to this when a group of my students at Michigan many years ago built the Internet Public Library. So they were thinking really hard about what did it mean to be a library with no physical presence. And we began to pull out what it meant to be a library and what the important features are. So if, if this is a good definition for whoops, being in the library, then the library is, by implication, the place, and I mean that both physically and virtually, uh, is the, and the stuff and the support and the interaction between people and information and, and resources, and the values that surround it. To me, those are the five essential things you have to be to be a library. Stuff, place, help, for lack of a better word, interaction and values. If you tweak those, you get a different kind of institution. If you tweak interaction, you get an archive. If you tweak values, you get a bookstore. 
uh, you tweak stuff, you get a museum. And so to me, that's a good sort of equation for thinking about what a library is and, and what it does and what it has to be. Uh, every one of those is going to change radically in the near term. In the, near term. Uh, the nature of place, um, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, the stuff is clearly changing become increasingly digital. Uh, the nature of the interaction between people and information, as I said, you know, texting while driving, intexticated they call it. Isn't that a great word? I love that. Driving while intexticated. Just to stay off my frequent roads is all I got. Uh, the values, that's an interesting one. You know, do we need to, are there new values that we should adopt for an increasingly digital world? Um, and clearly the nature of the support evolves with that as well. So, this, this implies to me a much broader notion of library and librarianship than I think we are used to thinking about. Um, that, that the library is now... I knew that was there. Somewhere and everywhere. To me, good libraries, great libraries, all libraries, have to be somewhere and everywhere. The physical presence matters. Um, the the li public library is living room. Um, the academic library is information commons. I'm a huge fan of that because that's that's a place where you come and you study together, you work together, you investigate together. It it makes a it makes a point. It makes a case for the importance of this sort of thing. Um, it is also absolutely necessary for housing physical objects like books and DVDs and archival materials and print journals and so on. So I mean, you've got to have a physical place for that stuff, even as that stuff becomes increasingly digital. So you have to be somewhere. There has to be a physical location. But you also have to be everywhere. Because you know, especially in the state like Montana, you know better than I do that you have people all over Helen Creation. And they're going to want to interact with stuff all the time, everywhere. So, both of those are important. Both of those are important, somewhere and everywhere. That, that to me, captures a lot of stuff. Um, and this difference in the way we think about information and the difference in the way we interact with it, uh, I think is deeply bound up with the notion of presence. Um, as someone who doesn't have a cell phone, that's an, does anybody else not have a cell phone? We should have a club. <laughs> Isn't it interesting to be the one that people bump into when they're walking down the sidewalk, you know, texting or whatever? Uh, you see things that other people don't see because you're not on a cell phone. Um, I don't mean to be snide about this. I just don't need one. I don't want one. I don't have kids. It's just me. And so I don't need one. But what, what seems to, what it looks like to me, is that as people tweet and post Facebook updates and read other people's Facebook updates and I am with each other and text with each other and are in in involved in things like Second Life and World of Warcraft and Halo, um, the new Halo just got released the other day and there were like 5,000 people in Seattle at the release party because um, the company is in a suburb of Seattle. Um, they're on the phone, they're in person. Um, it is easier, and, and doing those things sometimes simultaneously, it, it, it seems as though it's almost like little pieces of themselves are now in multiple places. So you're on the phone with somebody, but you're also reading people's Facebook updates. And so there's a little piece of you on Facebook, and there's a little piece of you in World of Warcraft, and there's a little piece of you in a text message, and there's a little piece of you in a phone conversation. I don't want to get metaphysical about this, but I think people can be now in multiple places at the same time, interacting with different groups of people, interacting with, um, you know, interacting with lots of different groups, and this seems to be increasingly available and important. So it's almost like people are shooting out little pieces of themselves, you know, as as. Kind of, I, I almost think of it like tendrils, you know, like a plant. 
Like they're shooting these little pieces of themselves out, and, and those little pieces connect with other people's little pieces. And so, you know, I'm reading people's Facebook updates. I'm like, well, I don't really remember you from high school, but it's nice to know that your kid just went to soccer practice. <laughs> not going to the reunion last summer. Um, and you know, you just sort of little bits and pieces and little connections all over the place in a much more enmeshed way than I think we were, I mean, I remember when it was a big deal if I could use the phone by myself when I was in high school, you know, woo, and it's just an entirely different thing these days. Those presences, those, those pieces of people are tied to these environments. So people on Facebook have information needs that are getting solved one way or another. Um, people in Second Life are having information needs and other kinds of you know, virtual environments have information needs and those are getting satisfied in some way. Um, and in all these other kind of ways of, of being as well. And you know, th those information needs don't go away just because you're you know, somewhere slightly more distant interacting with so to me, you put all of this together, this multiple presence idea, and the, what does it mean to be in the library idea, and when you think about libraries, you put all of that together, and I come up with two conclusions. The first of which is to be where they are. Now that's an old song. Um, I think Anne Lippo came up with that first. It was under her or me, but I'll give it to her. Um, you have to be where they are. And, and, and to me, that is, not just branches, not just the appropriate hours, not just, you know, it, it's positioned and ready to support and assist and participate in what they want to do on their terms, in all of those places. Um, it, it's not unlike to me uh, thinking about if your institution was developing a new degree program, or you had a new faculty member with a research agenda um, who was joining the institution you would interact with them to try to design services, build collections, um, think about instructional needs that they would have. You would, you would work to, as the institution is sort of gaining new territory in public library domain, it would be if they got a new neighborhood or next to a new area or something like that, or new people were joining. Um, as you were adding new intellectual territory to what you do, you would think about what services to offer. I think, there's a sim I think there's an analogy to this kind of multiply present digital world, that as people spend more and more time in these digital environments, that's where they're spending their lives, and they're still your people. So enfolding that into what you do, enfolding that into your services, into your interaction, into your concept of place, into your values, and all of those makes sense because that will enfold and embrace them and where they are and who they are and what they want to do. Um, that's a challenge. I don't think it's insurmountable. I think that's the sort of thing we do all the time. But it, it's almost like you're adding new territory. When you add new territory, you develop services and collections to, to satisfy. So that's one way to think about it. So that's conclusion number one. Conclusion number two. This is really hard, and, um, but I think it's true, is we have to be better than that. Um, and we do a great job in person. You know, the, one of the things I love most about my profession, our profession, uh, is that study that was out in LJ uh, a couple years ago that asked, did a survey of librarians, and they said, you know, if you had it to do over again, would you, would you do it all again? Would you become a librarian? And something like 90% of us said, yes, I would do it again. That's, I mean, how many professions? Please, you know, my partner's a lawyer, trust me. 90% of them would not do it all over again. Certainly not the same way. Um, there's, there's not a lot of professions that can say that. And that's because we love what we do. And we do a great job. People walk into your buildings and, and interact with you. And they, and they get terrific service. Um, and we have to do better on that. Because when they cross the physical threshold and they walk into your building, they've, they've made a commitment. They've walked across campus, perhaps slugging through the snow. Yes, I remember how to drive that snow, but I never got enough after anymore. Um, 
Um, when they walk through the door and they've slogged across campus or they've driven to campus or, or made whatever trip they needed to make, they cross that threshold and they've made a commitment. And they more than likely are going to do what they came to do. They're going to pick up the hold, they're going to search the database, they're going to meet with you, they're going to browse the staff, they're going to interact with their study group, whatever it is they're going to do, they're going to do it. Um, and it's just, it's just weird physically and interpersonally to walk into a building and look around and like, oops, this isn't what I meant, and then walk out again. I mean, I know crazy people do, and sometimes not so crazy people do. Um, but it, it just doesn't happen. So they'll come and they'll stay for a little while and then they'll go. Online, if they're searching your database, if they're searching your catalog, if they're on a chat reference interaction with you, if they're somehow interacting with you virtually and it's not going really well, I'll try Wikipedia. I'll try Amazon. I'll try Google. I'll try Yahoo Answers to shoot me in the head. I'll try, I'll try, I'll try, I'll try, I'll try. Everything is a click away. And so if the services that we provide online are not better, more compelling, more interesting, of higher quality. And this is a really hard thing to think about. Because it's, you know, how do we do better? How do we do better than services that we've been after for a hundred years and have gotten the hang of finally? Um, how do you, I don't know. But I, to me, this conclusion is inescapable, that we have to better because the competition is so much stiffer. Now, there are situations where we're the only game in town. I, I, I grant you that. And in that, when that's the case, then you're fine. But um, in an increasingly digital, increasingly competitive information marketplace, everything's a click away. And for some people, they're even preferable. You know, oh, I like Wikipedia better because it's easy to use. Well, that may be true. But then you should actually like read it and tell me if you still like it. Um, mm. uh, so, I do have a couple ideas. I'm going to spend the next day or so talking about this stuff. Uh, just a couple things to get you thinking. Um, the word reference. I was born to be a reference librarian. My mother was a reference librarian. The, the, the six months that I spent a few days working, a few days a week working at the King County Library, which is the big county library system, and they had the phone reference service for the big lazy Susan of reference books. And a little thing of drool just started going down my chin. And they let me wear the headset. I'm like, oh my god! I'm the happiest day of my life. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Um, I think that's a terrible word. Reference is a dumb word. Because it means nothing. It really doesn't. I mean, it means something to us, but to normal people, it means nothing. And, and we're, and I, wrote, I write books about reference. So don't get me wrong. Uh, we're, it, it tracks your thinking. If you think of what you do as reference work, you think of reference work as what you do. And there's nothing wrong with that. But now we're back to the reference desk in 1905. So you think of reference work as search and collection development and reader's advisory, instruction, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's all fine. Mm. Try that out for size. Now, now that's been around for a long time. So I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, like mediation. Um, but if you, sorry, it's a little rap. It's it's like you know cat. Um, <laughs> uh, if you think about what we do as helping to connect people with what they're looking for, then that opens up lots of interesting doors. Like. Outreach service. Now, an outreach can mean going to faculty meetings, departmental faculty meetings. It can mean, you know, trying a service on Twitter. Um, somebody, somebody, I mean, there's been a discussion on Digiref, if any of you are on Digiref, about Twitter services the last few weeks, which is interesting. Um, uh, I can never think who it was. I always want to say it's UCLA, but it wasn't. I heard somebody talk at a conference once about they, they tried a Twitter reference service and it kind of fumbled along for a while until the athletic department heard about it and they loved it. 
Penn State. Penn State. Thank you. Jesus, I've been talking about UCLA for years. Penn State. And they loved it because that way you couldn't be doing the homework for them, for the athletes. Because in 140 characters, you can't do their homework. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> it's a measly virtue. But these days, we'll take any virtue we can get. Um, uh, advocacy. Um, there's a lot to be advocated for on university campuses these days about things like open access, about things like um, uh, alternative methods of scholarly communication, um, intellectual freedom, that sort of thing. Um, I think marketing is in there somewhere. Uh, if, if you think about that as helping people find ways to connect to what they're looking for. And then I'm a real fan of tool building. Um, some of my students think I invented the idea of a Pathfinder. Because <laughs> they've never heard of it. Pathfinders are great on the web. Pathfinder is a portal. It's much more exciting. It's much sexier to call it a portal. Ooh. Um, but it's a good old subject Pathfinder that I did in my reference class so long ago, I don't remember. Um, it's a great way of pulling together here are the right words to search, here's the right journals, here's the right call numbers, here's the right websites, here's the organizations. It's a great way to, you know, pull a lot of stuff together in a little bit of space. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, have you seen the videos that Cornell has done about read the Research Minutes videos that they've put up on YouTube? <coughs> a little 90 second how to search a database, how to tell the difference between a magazine article and a journal article, that kind of thing. They're fun, they're cute, they have little music in the background. Uh, I love them. Because there, you know, how many thousands of library brochures have been written about, you know, knowing the difference between finding scholars and <laughs> which have been ignored by generation and generation after generation of college students. Make a video. Oh look, it's cute. You know, like, follow the shiny object. But you know, okay, if you're distracted by shiny objects, we make shiny objects. This is not. Hard. We can yell at them or we can help them. Sometimes we do both. I, th I think. Um, how many times can you watch an iPhone commercial? There's an app for that. Before you start to wonder where ours are. There's an app for that. There's an app for that. 75,000 apps in the App Store. So they tell me. My journal has a cell phone. I wouldn't know what these are. 75,000 apps. There's got to be library apps there's something. Um, and, and widgets for people's you know, um, uh, laptops and so on. One of my favorite ideas, this was years ago at Chapel Hill. Somebody presented this at an ALA conference. Um, they were building an a uh, instant messaging reference service, and they wanted people, they wanted students to have uh, their screen name so that they could connect with them on instant messaging services. And they made up stickers, because you know, kids like the stickers on their laptop. And it was like a hello, my name is sticker with the name of the library reference service the screen name of it in the box, and they passed them out at orientation so people would stick them to their laptops and then it would be right there staring at them when they had a question. Love that. And it worked like a charm. You know, their service went up like 10 times. Simple, 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 but very common. Um, I gave a talk at um, Columbia a couple years ago, Colby University, and there, it was in their business school, and one of their marketing posters for the MBA program had that phrase on it, and it's kind of stayed with me ever since. Right now, someone is thinking of a better, faster, cheaper way of doing what you're doing. <laughs> oh, great. You know, like, you know. <laughs> um, uh, there, there are things we probably do that we don't have to do, or things that we have been doing that we probably don't. And one of the really important challenges that we face, especially in a resource-constrained time, okay, that's two, um, is, is figuring out what to give up. And, you know, you can do that either with, um, you know, the point of a gun or because it's a good idea. Um, it doesn't, in the long run, it probably doesn't matter which. Um, but if there's a service or a, you know, a function that just, that somebody else can do better, let them do it. Um, as much as I was born to be a reference librarian, the idea that somehow ready reference is going to come back, it's really not. It's coming on. Um, and I'm sure people still do ready reference on, on you know, Twitter and, and chats and so on, and that's, um, that's fine. 
But but that shouldn't be the message we give people. This is a this to me is a is an example of this. If you staff a reference service and make it look like your job is to answer 30 second questions, you're cheating them and yourselves. Because Google will do a decent job in answering those questions. It's not a great job, it'll do a decent job. But if you set up your service making the point that you are there for detailed, involved, important information needs, that'll change the way people think about it. Now change the way you think about it. And back to the word reference. People think reference is that. You know, how often do you hear people at the desk like, oh, you know, this is a quick one. Well, you know, three days later, it's not so quick anymore. <laughs> but if you present the service as, you know, make people stand up to do it. So clearly you're not supposed to be there for it because you're standing up. Um, I used to spend a day or two a week at, at the Suzuki. And I had a guy who every 90 seconds would back away from me because he thought that was all he was going to get. I don't think I was scary because he was liking it. But I kept saying, you know, it's okay. I got nothing else to do. There's nobody else here. I can help you for 20 minutes and it will be okay. And it was like a revelation to me. So, you know, figuring out how to orient what we do towards the kind of clientele we have and what they need and what, what, what nobody else can do any better. Mm, I think it works. A few other things, just to think about in your discussions over the next day or so and then beyond. Um, I don't think we do a really good job of telling people what we do. So articulating our strengths. Um, what we can offer that in terms of you know, quality and depth and richness of the collections, of the services, etc. I'm not sure people get that message. Um, I'm not sure people completely understand that we're there to help them. Um, this is not just a library thing. I lived in, in uh, Michigan for many years, and Ann Arbor has this big art fair. You know, like 500,000 people come over four days. And a couple of colleagues and I decided we would staff the information booth for the afternoon because it would be kind of fun. And mainly I was passing out maps and telling people where the deli was and where the bathrooms were. Okay. Which was fun. And so we're standing, picture the scene, in the middle of a street, because they block the streets off. We're in the middle of the street, there's a tent, there's a table with maps, and a huge sign on the front of the table, right here, that says information in about three foot high levels. It's an information scene. And this, I, this will haunt me to the day I die. This little girl and her mother are coming, walking down the street, and the little girl sees the tent and the table, and she's like, look, mommy, information. They can tell us, and mommy takes her by the hand and pulls her in the other direction and says, no, no, that's okay, honey, we don't want to bother them. <laughs> I nearly jumped over the table. Bother us for crying out loud, why do you think we're standing here? <laughs> uh, now, mind you, I don't ask for help at the Kmart either, so <laughs> but that's just me. Um, tools that help people without direct intervention, things like apps, um, uh, uh, videos, widgets, signs that make sense, um, websites that make sense, that don't say things like catalog and databases when people think Land's End and DMV. You know? <laughs> How about books? How about research help? How about I gotta write a paper? How about I wanna write a grant as the top level of your website? I'd save you something. Positioning ourselves and what we do as time savers, figuring out what we're best at, etc. Mainly what I want everybody to do, yourselves included, is to try stuff. And then tell the rest of us how it works. Um, does that look familiar to anybody? <laughs> is there anybody, I won't say old enough, experienced enough to remember this and is willing to admit it? It's the NEC pre-1956 imprints. Oh, let me tell you. Um, so I still teach this because <laughs> I'm really old, um, and because I'm because we still have it in open stacks. We're one of the last places left in the world that has this in open stacks. For those of you who are yet to be introduced to the joys of the National Union Catalog pre-1956 imprints, it's exactly what you think it is. It's this is the this is 746 volumes. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Lovingly embossed in green cloth. I mean, I just want to pet it. Just, um, of every book printed in the United States before 1956, and who held it in the middle 60s? So, I mean, it's a joke. It really is. Um, for about 25, you we're having little memories of this. <laughs> I wrote a column about this. That's the column I got more response to than any other column. I have written about every freaking thing in the information world that I can think of, and then some. This gets me an email. Oh, I remember when I used to have to move it from one building to another in the summer. It was really hot, and we didn't know what it was for, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, we did it three or four times. Oh, man! <laughs> They've been pulped or sold or burned or I don't know, made into modern art or something. Uh, there's very few of these left in, in OpenStax because it's really not particularly useful anymore. Now, I got the letters from the people at LC who said, we use this all the time. Yes, I imagine you do. And you're the only ones. You know, who else uses it? But um, for about 25 years, this was fantastic. This was if you needed to find something, you went to this and it was there and it was right and it was precise and a lot of blood and sweat and tears went into the making of this. And then it just went away. So you can look at this as like, wow, we spent a lot of time and money on this and it went nowhere. Or you can look at this and say, wow, what an incredible intellectual achievement this was. And would we have OCLC if we hadn't built this? Now there are days that wouldn't be such a bad idea. <laughs> we love OCLC. Um, uh, some of my best friends work at OCLC, so I mean, I got nothing bad to say about OCLC. Um, other than we should always remember we built it, so we have to blame if you don't like it. Um, but without without something like this, which was basically OCLC in 746 volumes, um, you know, the idea of of collaborative, ca ca collaborative cataloging, collaborative collections, this was a great boon for interlibrary loan, etc., would be very different. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a joke now, but for, for a while there, it was, it was rocking. So, I say we keep doing it. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you've heard all that already. I love that phrase, vision is a rudder for change. I stole that. Um, that's Betsy Wilson, who's the dean of the Intel Library. Um, she did a guest appearance in one of my classes, and people were asking her about how do you, how do you navigate change, and she, she said, you got to know what you're doing. So vision is a rudder for change. I love that. Easier said than done, but I love that. Somewhere in there is a cave painting of a bull. Um, that's Altamira in Spain. About 15,000 years ago, somebody painted that on the side of a cave. Um, and what you can, you can't see the bull particularly well, but you can see the mold damage. <laughs> This lasted for 15,000 years on the side of the cave. Somebody discovered it about, well, a while ago. And body heat and moisture have raised the humidity and temperature of the cave and allowed this mold to grow just in the last few years. So, careful what you wish for. Um, but that bowl was painted about 15,000 years ago. And it's actually quite a good rendering of a bowl. It's, unfortunately, you can't see the light, but it's quite a good rendering. We don't quite know what it's meant to signify. It's, it's like the paintings at cave paintings at Lascaux in France. We don't quite know what it's meant to signify. I saw this bull, I killed this bull, I ate this bull, this bull ran over me. We don't quite know what it is. But, but we do know that somebody painted that for a purpose as long ago as 15,000 years ago. Um, and my, my other favorite, favorite image along these lines is um, uh, that's in the Sonoran Desert, in the Pueblo, uh, from the Pueblo uh, area of the southwest, uh, I think in New Mexico. Uh, it's a negative handprint. So somebody laid their hand against a cave, uh, against the underside of a rock, and blew pigment against it, and left that handprint. Um, we don't know when, we don't know why. Is that a signature? Is that a... We don't know what that is. Um, but we know it's there, and it's still there. And to me, these, these two things um, speak about something very fundamental about what it means to be human. And 
to me, they kind of reduce to I was here. And if you go home tomorrow and look around your library, I think almost everything in your collection is some representation of I was here. And let me tell you, I was here and I tried to figure something out and here's my story. That's science, that's art, that's statecraft, that's law, that's religion and faith, that's politics, that's, I mean, that's drama, that's almost everything is we're trying to make meaning out of the universe around us. And one of the ways we do that is by trying to understand it and search. And so all of this emphasis on search in the last 10 or 15 years, I think there's a metaphysical undertone to that. I think there's a you know, search in, in the very broadest sense of the words going on. I don't think that's quite what we're Google, but you know, I think there's something to be said for that. Um, that's just one of those basic human urges, is to communicate and to be heard, and then to share that. Um, we have an urge to learn. We have, a learn. we have an urge to organize. So the catalogers were actually right. Kind of scary, um, <laughs> but bless their hearts, you know, they are on the right track. To search and make meaning, and all of that happens in the inherently ambiguous context of language. Um, these basic human urges don't go away, um, and they form the foundation of our society. I think they form the foundation of what it means to be human. Where does human activity go? Where people are trying to figure out the world and the universe around them and their place in it and tell their stories in the process, we go along. We are next to them, we are in that, uh, gathering the products, helping to create new ideas and new pathways, and helping to blaze the trail as we, make, as we try to make progress as a species, um, which is really hard. Um, and so now I go back to Margaret Hutchins. Reference has become an independent Reference, eh, facts by which themselves they could not attain. It's finding the pieces of the puzzle to fit in what people are trying to figure out and understand and learn and express and be. Finding those pieces that fill in the gaps, that make the puzzle complete in lots of different ways, in lots of different environments, in lots of different settings, lots of different purposes for lots of different kinds of people. That's what we do. And thinking about how to do that in old ways and new ways, um, in a high level of professionalism, saving people's time and money, etc. As I tell my students all the time, there's nothing better you can do with your life. There's no better time to try to do with this. Um, and I hope that gives you something to think about. I'm going to put you on the hot seat a little bit. You mentioned at one point stuff that we are doing now that we should not do. Yeah. Can you go into detail about stuff we should not do? <laughs> well, I use the example of ready reference. <clears throat> and people have heard this over the years. At least I'm on tape now, finally saying. People have heard me say we shouldn't do ready reference anymore. Just not what I believe. I believe we should do ready reference. If that's what people want. But if we create, staff, and market a service that is oriented in that way, that's a losing proposition. Because the market for that is never going to grow. And there are ways that people can do that more effectively without us. And, and it makes us look like chumps. So if you instead design and staff and market a service that is aimed at what we do best, understanding what people really want, understand, helping people understand what they really want, which Google cannot do. Um, exploring the wide range of resources that your institutions represent, which Google cannot do. Figuring out multiple ways of engaging and searching that stuff, which Google cannot do. 
helping people to understand when they should stop, <laughs> which is a much more difficult prospect than anybody really realized. Um, instructing about the process and the resources where and when, when that's feasible, because you, know, you can lead a horse to water. Uh, that service is what a librarian is made for. <coughs> Typing stuff into Google is monkey work. Now, I do it every day, you do it every day, I got no problem with that. But if, if people think that that's all you do, then they think you're a monkey. But if people think you are there to engage with, how do I start a new line of research? How do I, you know, apply for a grant? How do I start a new degree program? How do I decide what to be when I grow up? How do I decide what to write my senior thesis on? How do I, how do I, how do I, how do I? Then, that's a then you say, yeah, come and talk with me. We'll meet for 30 or 45 minutes and we'll figure something out. That is a much higher level of intellectual uh, engagement. It's a much more satisfying thing for you professionally, I think, I hope. Um, and and it, it provides a higher level of service to probably fewer people. And that's one of the things that we have to engage is to what extent are we a niche profession? Because I've seen lots of libraries that say, especially public libraries, but we're all we're all susceptible to this. We give you the world. You know, we can do anything, which is a lie. We can't. We can't do everything. We can't, we never did, we never can, we never should. It's not our job. We can do these things for you really well. It's easy to say we give you the world because it sounds nice and we're good people and blah blah blah. But it's not the truth. So Helping people to understand what we can and can't do, um, and focus on that. And, and I would actually rather do more higher quality stuff for fewer people than monkey work for the multitude. And I have no issue with monkey work for the multitudes. I'm as happy as a clam, tippy tappy tippy tappy into Google and find an answer, or the World Almanac, or the OED, or whatever. I'm, I it would be that would be. A, when I, don't, when I go to that great reference desk in the sky, that's what I'll be doing. You know, surrounded by the big lazy Susan of resources. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. In the meantime, here in the real world, um, if, if I were still a practicing reference library, I would much rather spend an hour with somebody making their senior thesis five times as good, or helping a faculty member write a grant proposal, or that sort of thing. Because it's just much more satisfying. And I think it sort of gets at why we got into this business in the first place, to me. So that's not exactly giving stuff up, so much as it's kind of reorienting to something that we can do much more effectively, and efficiently, and better. But it may mean that there are people you don't engage with them. Okay, that's a decision. Now, every institution makes its own decisions on that kind of score. Every individual staff <coughs> and, and there's people who would think that, there's people who you work with who would think this stuff is a great idea, and people who think it's correct. Okay, fine, figure it out. Okay. You know, it's, it's, it's up to all of us. There's no, there's certainly, your mileage may vary. Trust me. <laughs> Trust me. Isn't that why it's so much harder for us to do that online? Because the expectation online is that yeah. this. Yeah. And yeah. our whole model of service is where we succeed. Where we are really the best is what you just described, which is not this. No. And so the idea of trying to engage a person online or to lead that person through a thought process or, or some other higher level work online is either we have to vacate that completely on that online mode, and then the idea, then the question is can. You know, it's back to, we, we can do everything. Well, we can't. We don't have the resources, we don't, right. have, we don't have necessarily the interest to compete True. with Google, True. to True. compete with those kinds of things. So yeah, I think that's partly the, the barrier for us to making huge leaps online. We, can, we need to look at better tools for, for mining the, the research, the, the data that we have, so we make that a little in, in terms of the interpersonal engagement online, I'm not so sure.
sure we want to do that. Super. I don't. I, I don't disagree that we yeah. need to do better, but it's it's a kind of a hard one to figure out as to better for what purpose and towards what end. The, the, the last phrase that I couldn't, I, I, I agree with everything you just said. Um, I couldn't agree more with that last piece as well. Is that <clears throat> better in what way? Yeah. Better in what sense? I mean, the idea that you're going to be able to do, you know, deep, meaningful research engagement with people by Twitter is ridiculous. And nor would I think anyone should try. Um, what you can do in Twitter is, wow, that's really interesting. I can give you a little, this is like six or eight tweets. Wow, that's really interesting. <laughs> I can give you a little help here, but this is a big problem and it's going to be a lot easier if you come in and talk to me. Which some people will go with and some people won't. But trying to provide that kind of high level deep service in a chat message or Twitter or something like that, I don't think does anybody do that. Because it's going to give them a crummy answer and they're, going to feel, they're not going to feel particularly satisfied. Um, uh, by the same token, you have people who come in and are ready to work for an hour and a half and it's over in five minutes. That's fine too. Um, or, you know, I, I'm going to need some time with this. Can I email this to you? Or can I call you? Or can you come back? Or, I mean, the, the modes by which people approach us and the modes by which we respond don't necessarily have to be the same. Um, the, the, the better online thing, I think at least on a superficial level, is the quality of the experience. And so, you know, research tells us over and over and over again. 50% of the time, there's no reference in it. In person, on the phone, in chat. Okay, that's just bad. That's just bad. I, I can't imagine what that's like. I mean, I get it online. You know, hi, do you have any books about Amelia Earhart? Yes. You know. <laughs> because you're online and you're like, I'm not talking to that. I, just, I get that. I mean, I've done online references. I don't know very good at it. Great email. <laughs> email reference I was born in. As it goes on for page after page after page. Um, <laughs> and I'm decent online. I'm decent in person. But, but the idea that there's no interview, it just, it's unfathomable to me how that really does. Um, but, and I have my students as part of their um, reference when I, when I teach reference. They, um, one of their assignments is they have to ask questions of other services where they're not known. And in person, email, and chat. And they get so mad when they're not interviewed. Because, you know, they ask a question, sometimes a really well-formed question, and out comes an answer without a, you know, what, which, why, or where for. It had nothing to do with what they were asked, but it was, you know, thanks, but, and you're, you know, it was over, you know, and leave a 20 on the nightstand, and off. And, and so, the, the, the quality of the experience, things like making sure that there is an engagement on some sort of level and they, to, to know that you're answering the right question, or that they know what they're asking which is often not the case, that the website is somehow engineered and organized and designed in such a way that it can be used and that people can easily make their way to what they're looking for and, um, and can find their way back again, um, that, that there's a pleasantness to it. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite phrases, Ruth Sass, who some of you may know, she's the about to be former director at Omaha Public and is about to go to Sacramento Public. She said, I want people who use our library to be delighted. Well, now that gives you a whole new way of thinking about it. You know, delighted. What's wrong with delighted? I love delight. Um, delight is hard to do in Twitter. <laughs> well, maybe not. Um, but that's a different kind of delight. Um, there's, there's, but the quality of the interaction, I think online the quality of information can be higher, but it's harder. Um, and it's sometimes harder to think about the quality of the interaction. And because so many of us are people people, uh, except the handful of us who aren't, and I've worked with a few of them, um, who actually are better online because they don't have to interact with actual people, um, it's, 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 a, it's a challenge to think about how to re-engage in a, in a new kind of domain and yet still feel like a professional. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things in motion here. And as I say, there's no right or wrong answer to it. Um, but I know we're up against this. This I know. And so we cannot beat them at their own game. You cannot beat Google, you cannot beat Wikipedia.
don't try. It's a losing proposition. You, have, you don't have that kind of time and money. Figure out how to use Google and Wikipedia and Twitter and all the other things. And incorporate that into a professional practice that makes sense for you and for them. It's, it's really tempting to like, how do we get them to stop using Wikipedia? Sorry, all this is left the building. Um, but, but, Wikipedia. So that project information literacy thing that I think you read a piece about or maybe you've heard about, whatever, that they're serving college students all over the country and they know that students are using Wikipedia and they don't feel good about it. They feel bad about it because they know it's not a quality resource and they're not supposed to use it, so they don't tell anybody they use it, but they use it all the time. And they use it to get oriented, to pick a project, to pick a, to pick a topic, and to find language to use to search databases. That is great information instincts. That is exactly what we want people to do. And yet, the databases aren't easy to use. So how about a workshop offered, you know, at the time when all the papers are starting to be written, which we know is in the last 72 hours. 90% of students wait till the last 72 hours for 90% of their problems. This is every college that they serve in, Harvard to community colleges. So, workshops. Wikipedia to the database. You know, how to use Wikipedia to find the right terms to search in a database. Offer it on a Sunday night. Not kidding. When they're going to be starting to work on their papers for the following week. <laughs> it's worth a try. It's worth a try. Because it's what they're doing. They're using Wikipedia at the last minute. Design a workshop. How to use Wikipedia at the last minute. I wouldn't be a bit surprised that we can done it because they're doing it already. You're, I mean, you're legitimizing it, but you're also making it work. That to me is a real, that's a real potential. That's a real, and if, so if you do one less, you know, how to use ProQuest session, which do people still do this anymore? How to use ProQuest? <laughs> um, uh, you know, give that up, do how to use Wikipedia at the last minute. And when the faculty say, why are you doing that? Point to the research. You know, project information literacy. ProjectInfoLit.org. You may not like it, but this is what your students are doing. So you give me a better idea. I don't care. Shiny It's just different shiny. Other stuff. Yes, sir. Where, um, I, you mentioned delight earlier. I'm just curious, where in the whole process does delight happen? Does that happen after an answer is found? Does that happen at when they're engaged? Or? Sure. I mean, the joke is in the stacks, of course, but we've known that for <laughs> decades and decades and decades. Um, and the bigger the building, the more opportunities for delight there are. Um, yeah, why not? You know, I, I mean, think about your retail experiences. Um, because in a lot of ways, there are a lot of parallels between going to a department store, or going to a Home Depot, or whatever, and going to a library. You know, experiences that you had that really stood out in your mind. Someone who went the extra mile, someone who really understood what you were looking for, someone who found exactly the right thing and you felt good about it. Um, those kinds of experiences. You know, sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes there isn't anything. There isn't a good book, there isn't a good article, nobody's ever done this. You know, delivering that message in an appropriate way can be good too. Um, but, but trying to Trying to do all this in such a way that it that it makes sense to them and to us. And it makes them feel good. Even when you have to deliver bad news. At least we're not, you know, lawyers or used car sales people or whatever. We don't really have to deliver bad news very often. Not terrible news very often. So that's a virtue. Um, but why not why not make it good? And it and by and large it is good. You know. But my experience at Suzawa would tell me hardly a shift went by when I'm standing at that reference desk working with largely undergraduates, some graduate students, largely undergraduates. I don't think a shift went by when somebody didn't say to me, I didn't know a librarian would do that. <laughs> okay, well, that's not your fault. That's ours. So we'll work on that. Or I've been in a library since I was in fifth grade because they were mean to me and I never went back. <laughs> so the message I give to the children's librarians is that they're the most important. 
because if they screw up, the rest of us pay for it. <laughs> um, you know, uh, so that's my message to them. Uh, my message here is that, you know, that there's a lot of people who just don't know me better. And I, I'm, I would imagine, I'm going to stereotype like crazy here, forgive me, I'm going to imagine you get a lot of people from very small areas that have pretty sparse library services. And so they don't know anybody. And they come to a place like yours. Um, and if, you know, we get it all the time. This coming week, people will be walking into Susan or into that reading room, like, although it's on the third floor, so they have to make an effort. Wow, oh my God. You know, so to humanize that a little bit and to delight them. I think we're going to actually have to stop ah. now. We're going to it over. Is that okay? <laughs> Joe's going to be here for the rest of the conference. Yep. So we don't have plenty of time to ask some questions. We'll take a 15-minute break. And then when you come back,